true cases. The Division of Public Police engages in a pattern and practice of using excessive force. Real victims. No, he's not all right. They were pounding him in the head. Examined by two experienced investigators. These cars shouldn't say to protect and serve, or they should be adding themselves in the bottom. It should say to protect and serve ourselves. The Miss Clues. Austin School Police acknowledging today that they should have done more to investigate. The cover-ups. It was a cover-up, and I, I, I think that uh, people were looking out for their own scam. From the extensive work by Salvatore Restorelli and Ira Robbins comes the Archangels of Justice case files. I am your host, Joe Ross, and I will be your guide on this quest to find the answers and give a voice to the victims of these tragic cases. Hello to our listeners, and thank you again for joining us, wherever you are, for the Archangels of Justice case files. This is the final episode in an eight-part series of our first season, looking into the Sheena Moore's case. If you wait to the end of the episode, I'll be updating the listeners on the future of this podcast and when the next series will start. Also, some of the things to expect in the future. As we move to our final episode and close this case, we will have Sal, Ira, and Kelly give their thoughts on what they think happened, but also their final thoughts on this case and the podcast. We will also be speaking with some other people in Sheena's life. But before we get started, here is a message from our sponsors. Do you want to launch your own podcast or host your own media? Then you should be looking at Blueberry.com. That's B-L-U-B-R-R-Y.com. With no third-party sites to log into, you remain in control by never leaving your website and having an iTunes and SoundCloud-friendly RSS feed. Get your 30-day free trial by just typing AOJ Podcast when you check out, and you could be broadcasting your very own media today. Our other sponsor is TotalFrontPage.com. Did you know that approximately 95% of purchase decisions are made on the first pages of search engines? TotalFrontPage.com knows this, and they can do what no other digital marketing company does. Put your company name in the autocomplete box of Google and Bing so that searchers see your business before they see any other company. Your business will appear in most, if not all, organic listings. No competitors, just you. If you'd like to know more about this groundbreaking service, you can check out their website, totalfrontpage.com, or for a free consultation, mention AOJ Podcast in the subject line when you email info at totalfrontpage.com. Act today because once these search terms are purchased, they cannot be used by any other company. Thank you to our sponsors. With that, I give you the final episode of the Sheena Morris case. As we close the Sheena Morris case, I want to bring in some other people from Sheena's life, including one of her best guy friends, Kelly Holland, her stepfather, Kevin Osborne, and her stepmother, Lisa Lane. I will also talk to Sheena's mother, Kelly Osborne, and of course, our two archangels, Sal and Ira. They will be talking about what they think happened that morning and also their final thoughts on the case. But before we get into that, we want to talk about something interesting that happened just a few days ago and one of the reasons why this was delayed. The Archangels were recently contacted by Rebecca and Naya through Facebook. If you remember, she was the one who claimed to be one of Sheena's closest friends, but would not give Sheena's clothes back to Kelly after her passing. She was also seen on a date with Genoese a few weeks after Sheena's memorial service. Rebecca, needless to say, was unhappy with the way she was represented in a few of the episodes and asked why she was featured when she was, quote, not involved. Well, we politely reminded her that she involved herself when she agreed to be interviewed by the FDLE and then told them she was one of Sheena's closest friends, when that could not be further from the truth. We asked her on the podcast to clear up the confusion, but she refused and began making the same unsubstantiated claims about Sheena that she did in the FDLE report. Again telling us Sheena was very depressed and that it was caused by her mother, and that she was the only one that knew this because she was closer to Sheena than any of her friends. We followed that up and asked her why Sheena's father, who spoke with Sheena just about every day, had never heard Sheena mention her name, and why if she loved Sheena so much, she didn't tell anyone Sheena was depressed. Rebecca had no response and then began calling Sheena's mother Kelly Osborne names. Remember, this is the person who Genoese and the FDLE claimed was one of Sheena's best friends. And as our exchange continued, she made the friends claim again, but then just a few minutes later started attacking Sheena's character. But here is the worst part. Rebecca was unable to correctly spell Sheena's mother's last name. It was a very interesting exchange that further shed light on this person and backed up many of the things Kelly said about her. Rebecca should not have been considered a friend of Sheena, but instead a person that seemed to us to still be jealous of Sheena to this day. It is unbelievable to us that the FDLE leaned so heavily on her as a witness 
or the Genoese claimed that Rebecca was one of Sheena's closest friends. I thought that exchange would be interesting to our listeners and further enforce the fiction the FDLE report was. As we continue with the final episode of this case, and after hearing feedback from some of the listeners, I thought it'd be interesting to have Sal and Ira talk about what they think happened that morning based on their investigative work. My belief is that what happened to Sheena Morris was she was murdered. Someone went back to that hotel room and got into that hotel room with a key or was invited in. Who that person is, I can't say for certain. But I can say that she did not commit suicide. And the, and the fact of the matter is, is that nothing that FDA, Manatee County Sheriff's Office, Bradenton Beach, or the state attorney can say to change it is they did not prove she committed a suicide. The amount of evidence that they ignored, didn't process, is, is, is a crime in itself. And for them to accuse this girl of committing suicide and assassinating the character of her family and her is a crime in itself, as we had mentioned in the last episode. There was a murder committed. There's no doubt about that. Someone went into that room and silenced Sheena for whatever reason. Had it, had it something to do with Joe Genoese and what she knew about Joe Genoese? We won't know the answers to that because of the shoddy investigation done by the police in the beginning. All the evidence that was destroyed that might have made the difference, we can't get it back. And that's the sad part of this whole case. Somewhere along the line, these police officers let a murderer go free. And that's unacceptable. We know that Sheena Morris was murdered. um, And in my opinion, it could have been done by at least two people, but not limited to them. First, it could have been done committed by Joe Genoese, who had the motive and and, uh, anger and uh, history of violence and is, uh, in my opinion, an all-around kind of an unethical, pathetic individual who has no control of his own emotions. Or it could have been done by Officer Bazell. Um, In my opinion, he's got the same attributes that Joe Genoese has. And uh, could have been somebody from the hotel, could have been anybody. But unless they do good work or better work than they've done, they they could never solve it. It's just been wrecked beyond repair by lousy police work and a major cover-up. Next, I have Kelly do the same. What I think happened is that Genoese worked very hard on making sure that Sheena and I were in an argument um, so that when New Year's Eve came around, she would not be with us and she would be with him. Even though they had had their many breakups in those days leading up, um, I think that I think that this was planned. I think he did everything he could to get her to go to Anna Maria Island, even though she had declined several times, and then he finally succeeded. I feel that they spent their time there. Um, I feel that he, I feel that, that Sheena did have something on him. And I think she threatened to, to expose that. And she said it to numerous people, myself, my husband, her father, and her friends that she had some things on him that could destroy him. I think that she got so mad at him, she told him she was going to do that. And then I think he worked towards his next plan. And I feel that that night in that hotel room, he was able to regain access to that room. I feel that Sheena might have been laying down, go to sleep, wait till the next morning to give me a call to come pick her up. I think that he re-entered that room. I think he put a pillow over her head while she laid on her stomach and suffocated her. That pillow wound up underneath the bed in that hotel room and it was never confiscated, tested for evidence, nothing. 
uh, it was just left there. I feel that he got in his car and um, he tried to, you know, make his footsteps, but he was the one, he's the one that had been drinking heavily. Um, but I do believe he re-entered that room and he suffocated her face down. The marks on her back, um, I know one investigator had mentioned it almost looks like there was a heel or fist mark on the back of her neck and on her shoulder blade and almost looked to appear that the markings on her back shoulder blade uh, looked like it was like wrinkles from a pair of jeans that had been knelt on her. I feel that he carried her into that shower and staged it to make it look like a suicide because there was no talk about suicide prior to that morning. And that morning is when he called and told me that they had had a domestic violence situation. He said he wasn't going back down to Anna Maria Island because he didn't want to get arrested for domestic violence. As we continue, I wanted to give other voices from Sheena's life, from the people who really knew her and could share stories. The first person we spoke with was one of Sheena's best guy friends, Kelly Holland. I will use both his first and last name so you don't get confused between him and Sheena's mother. But if you remember back to episode four, when we talked about the Dr. Phil show, Kelly Holland was the one who witnessed Genoese grab me a gun from his car when talking to one of Sheena's ex-boyfriends. But before we get to that, we talk about when him and Sheena first met and how Sheena became more mature as they grew up. First met Sheena in high school. She was a, a grade younger than me. She was transferred in from a, another school, a local school uh, nearby. And uh, we had a lot of similar friends. I hung out with a similar group of friends. And uh, she, she was probably 15 or so when I met her, and I was probably 16. Um, so yeah, we stayed friends for a long time and then, uh, she moved down to Florida and I, I was, uh, going to college in New Orleans. So we started hanging out even more than, than regular, like after, after high school, uh, I think is when we became really, really close, became really good friends. And, um, when I was, yeah, going to school in New Orleans, she would come and visit me, I'd say a few times per semester. And then I would go down there quite often during breaks and, uh, I'd go for spring break or a couple times during summer break or Christmas break. Um, so we tried to see each other a lot, even though we lived in, you know, cities that were 10 hours or so away from each other. When she was young, I mean, like all of us, I think uh, sometimes a little crazy, hard to hard to control. <laughs> but, um, yeah, she started becoming much more mature and trying to, you know, becoming more political and outspoken on things other than just trying, you know, being more of a, a socialite party scene kind of person. She was... Um, maturing into, you know, more of a grown woman. He also went on to talk about spending time at the Osbournes with Sheena. When I went to Florida, I always like made a point to to go there. It was always a, a fun place to to be. I loved the hanging out with Kelly and Kevin and and Sheena and her grandma there. We had a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, when I would come to town, we'd spend I'd say most of our time there. We spoke about his thoughts on Genoese and the fact that he witnessed many of the same outbursts of anger that had been echoed by other people. But the story he remembered most vividly was the one he shared on the Dr. Phil show. And it was an instance between Genoese and one of Sheena's ex-boyfriends, Sal. I had him elaborate on this incident. I definitely saw like the jealousy when it came to some of Sheena's ex-boyfriends. I'd say Sal in particularly. So, um, because I think that probably happened because it was... In summer 2008, when Sal or Sheena and Joe broke up, and then Sheena started dating Sal, and then later that year in the fall, I think, yeah, it was later that summer actually, um, Sheena and, and Joe got back together, and anytime anyone would mention Sal's name, Joe would get really upset. Um, you know, Joe's always nice to me. Um, I was going through um, some. You know, th- I was kind of depressed with just stressed out, not depressed necessarily, but stressed out from school, um, strung out from a summer abroad program and 
and getting back into a fall, a swing of a fall semester. And I, I really just didn't feel like I had um, a chance to relax and have fun. Um, and Sheena sensed that in one of our, our phone calls um, towards the summer of uh, 2008, end of summer 2008. And she planned a trip to come to New Orleans to hang out and kind of cheer me up a little bit and kind of help me get focused on my last year, my thesis year of college. And um, there was a storm coming in, Hurricane Gustav, and it looked like it was going to hit um, New Orleans a similar way that Katrina did. And instead of, um, you know, canceling her flight and saying, hey, you know, this isn't, um, this isn't smart to fly to New Orleans with a, a hurricane head, head your way. Um, well, she knew that I had just had a, a, a pretty tr bad issue with my truck and I was, you know, going to have to try and figure some other way to, to leave the city. So she canceled her flight and decided she and Joe were going to drive to New Orleans instead and hang out for a couple of days, pick me up, bring me to, back to Tampa with them while the hurricane was headed for New Orleans. Um, so I thought that spoke a lot of, you know, just Sheena and, you know, personality and, and Joe's willingness to help Sheena out when, you know, one of her friends was, um, you know, in need or, you know, just needed to see her or whatever the case was. Um, but while I was on that trip to, to Tampa, um, Sal, who I became friends with while she was dating uh, Sheena, heard that I was in town. So he reached out to Sheena because he didn't have my number uh to, to try and get in touch with me and that came out while we were on our drive to dinner one night and joe immediately reacted very jealously um in a way that i had never seen him act before prior to this and uh so it was caught me off guard i really didn't know if it was just like a, a joke i remember thinking like oh, he's just joking or he's not actually mad about that and I remember having to try and calm him down and say, hey, man, like this is, it wasn't trying to, you know, get a hold of Sheena or trying to get back with Sheena. It was clearly just a, he was trying to get my phone number. And uh, anyway, so he kept blowing it way out of proportion and um, he ended up turning the vehicle around and then, uh, you know, basically, <laughs> you know, our, our evening plans are scrapped for the, for the night, but um, as we drove back to Sheena's apartment, he was getting more and more heated about the fact that Sal called Sheena and he, he basically wasn't going to stand for it. So he, he got Sheena to call Sal back and he was on the phone with Sal and I, I can't remember if they're on speakerphone or they were just screaming so loud back and forth at each other that I could hear, you know, Sal on the other side of the phone. But they were basically, you know, trying, they, they both going back and forth at each other. And basically Joe challenged them to meet up that night kind of thing. And, and when he was doing that, I don't know why he decided this was a smart idea because, you know, Sal's on the phone. It's not like he's scaring him or threatening him because he can't see anything. But Joe decides to pull out a, a pistol, a revolver from the uh, glove box of, of his SUV and and that's when Sheena's like the hell with this basically and she marches up to her apartment um I tried to dissolve it a little bit further with Joe um I can't remember exactly where you know what when I decided that you know enough was enough with Joe at that moment but I decided to go upstairs to Sheena's apartment and the door was locked so you know I knocked on the door Sheena, Sheena just made sure that I was by myself, and she she tell she lets me in the apartment. So he is not coming in here with that gun. So um, a few minutes later, uh, Joe knocks on the door, and so I, I step outside, locking the door behind me, and I just told him, "Hey, like you know, you can come in, but not with the gun." Sheena said, "No guns in the apartment. So if you go put the gun back in your truck, you know, you, we can, we'll make sure that she lets you back in." Um, Anyway, so I walk with Joe down to the truck. He puts the gun away. I talk to him a little bit more, trying to calm him down, see him like, hey, it's not worth it. Like, it's, it's stupid. Like, you're it's kind of blowing out of proportion a little bit. I feel like as I walk back to the apartment, he started to, like, realize how overboard he got with it. Like, it was just a really insignificant phone call, and he made it seem as if it was life and death or something that was, you know, Dr super drastic and dramatic um 
Well, anyway, so we get back to Sheena's apartment and Sheena basically reiterates the same sentiment that I had. And Joe concedes and admits that, you know, he blew it out of proportion and, you know, want to do it again kind of thing. And, uh, you know, we, from what I remember, I think, you know, we had a pretty decent night after that, but it was still like this weird vibe I felt like in the air from the whole, from all the drama, I guess that happened earlier. I'm not, that's not really my, my scene so much, like all that drama. So, um, I, I just remember being super awkward the rest of the night. Other weird behavior Kelly Holland observed and heard about Genoese was how he acted at the memorial services for Sheena. We spoke about that. The day of the services in New York um, is very much, look at me, I lost my fiance um, attitude, uh, vibe maybe that he was putting out, and <clears throat> which I remember thinking was contradictory towards the way he was actually acting when it was just me and him or um, us as a small group or me on the phone with him. So I, I remember thinking that was strange. Like I, I thought, well, maybe that's everyone deals with things differently. And then I thought, well, why is the act he's putting on different than the way he's acting towards me? You know, does that, yeah. if that makes sense? I was really, really strange. And I, I remember struggling with that for quite some time, like acting about that. And I, I have friends, quite a few friends in Tampa <clears throat> that went to the services um, there. And I remember talking to them, I want to say a day or two. Yeah, it was a couple of days after the services in New York. And they asked me how Joe acted here, well, there in New York. And I remember just saying it was strange, something like that. I didn't, I didn't know how, what to make. I didn't know what to make of it yet. And they're like, "Oh my God, the way he was acting here, it was insane. Like it was all about this, you know, this show he was putting on, and this, you know, um, like I just talk more about like the attire people were wearing to the services than how are you doing, how are you feeling, you know what I mean? And it was really, really awkward." was it probably the best word I think that they used. So uh, once I realized he did it, you know, in both places, it was, it just, I couldn't make sense of it basically. And I, I kind of realized I need to start to probably distance myself from Joe. You know, he didn't seem like a person I probably wanted yeah. in my life after that. And, uh, you know, uh, he definitely wasn't going to help me get through the, the, you know, the serious issue of losing my best friend. So I, I, I kind of started to distance myself from Joe after that. About a month after Sheena's memorial services, Kelly Holland was contacted by Genoese, who asked him to go to dinner. Although he was very apprehensive at first, he met with Genoese anyways. And here's what Kelly Holland remembers from that outing. I don't remember him breaking down and crying at all um, that, that week or so that he was in New York. Um, I could be wrong, but I just don't, I don't remember it. Um, there was a time a few months after that, uh, after the, the services and everything in New York, um, he came to New Orleans just before Mardi Gras and he wanted to meet up with me. And, um, I was super, super hesitant to, to do that. And I, I talked to, to Kelly, to Sheena's mom and, um, she was like, you know, go do it and, you know, see how he acts and that kind of thing. And I, I was very nervous. Um, but anyways, I met up with Joe in New Orleans and, one point of the night, uh, we went to dinner and had a few drinks, that kind of thing for the night. Anyway, um, one point of the night, just <clears throat> out of nowhere, um, I remember I'm just have, just crying, you know, and I just felt like it was, it didn't seem authentic. Um, it seemed <clears throat> like I wasn't, I wasn't crying. I think I was, just, we were just talking about Sheena in general and maybe telling a story and then all of a sudden I just started crying with it. Well, that, that story wasn't really like a, a, an emotional, tearful story, but okay. Like I kind of just thought it was strange. And then um, I think you're, you're going this way, but like on the Dr. Phil show, it was the same exact thing again. All of a sudden it was just like out of nowhere. I'm, I can't stop crying. And it, again, it didn't feel authentic. And uh, I was just like, it, so after I saw it a couple of times, I was like, this is clearly his MO. This is his, go-to move kind of thing 
um, when probably is backed up in a corner and doesn't have the right response. Uh Next, I spoke with Kelly Holland about the FDLE report and how he was represented. The one thing that really stood out to him was how they talked about what he said about Sheena and Genoese's kids. I the, the children part was the part that I definitely didn't understand because I never I don't think I ever talked to Sheena about Joe's kids other than the fact that he has kids and he has an ex wife and um I know when it came to the ex wife there was some sort of malcontent between either her and Sheena or Sheena and her I don't know which way it went but anyways there was something there and I, I'm sure that Sheena mentioned that she didn't like you know having to pay alimony or whatever it was um but when it came to those things those are things that i didn't really get involved in like she didn't didn't talk to me about joe's kid so i felt like when they put that under you know the area where they talked to me i i felt like i'm the last person to that they should be taking that portion from they asked me about it so i gave a response saying sure like she 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 probably didn't like giving the money or you know she she um I about knocking around with the kids. So that's something that like, first off, I don't think she would ever tell me that. I never saw Sheena not like, like saying she didn't like kids. Like that, that doesn't say something I would have said, like no way. And again, I'm the last person that should talk to about that. Like she didn't talk to me about those kind of issues. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like their relationship. Sure. His relationship. I don't care about like, right. Like, I don't care how he gets along with his ex-wife or his kids. Like I, I never met his ex-wife. I never met his kids. So I, I think that's what I told FDLE is that I never met his children and I never met his ex-wife. Why would Sheena talk to me about them? Yeah, it was, it was disheartening, I guess, to say the least. Um, I was, I had high hopes, I guess. I really thought that, um, that they were out to look at everything uh, subjectively um, or objectively rather, um, and take a look at every fact and then form a conclusion. And then when I looked back at it, I realized that, you know, they already had their conclusion. And in my opinion, they already had their conclusion and that they used my words in a way to fix or fit into their conclusion. They already had, uh, you know, previously put together basically and and I I remember thinking that when I read it and then I talked to to Juddy and to Kelly and to others and remember thinking that was, did they do you feel like they took your words the way that you said it or they took your words you know and, and made it sound different and I remember I can't remember who or what they said but or who I talked to or what they said but I feel like other people felt similar that to me that um that was, you know, their way to say, okay, we, the squeaky wheel got the grease, but we're not, we're not changing anything. We, we're just gonna, um, we, we listened to you. We, we did our due diligence, quote unquote due diligence, and, um, mm-hmm. and came back up with the same conclusion that we were already going to come up with because I, I don't know if that was out of, you know, maybe laziness or, um, or whatever the case may be, but I felt like, I felt like it was lip service. Um, I remember thinking that it was it was this this was what we had been fighting for for all this time, and they just did it because they were, they felt like they had to, and not that they wanted to do the right thing. As we continued our conversation, Kelly Holland talked about what the last few years have been like without Sheena. I guess the one thing that has changed is that I definitely question things a lot more than I used to. Or like I mentioned before, if a, an authority is telling me this is the truth and this is what happened, I don't take it at face value anymore. I make sure that I've kind of really looked into it and, you know, kind of ask some bigger picture questions. So it's definitely helped, you know, shape me more into, I guess, the person I am today that I, I question things more and I don't just think that everyone's out there to do good um i think that some people are out there and um that just i guess maybe um perpetuate their own agenda and not Mm -hmm. really care about um helping other people um i used to think that people all people are good and you know we're all out there trying to help each other and maybe so i become more cynical in that way that you Mm -hmm. know they're realizing that some people are, are not out there just 
to help each other and you know that there's still like a lot of people out there that could really care less about the truth sometimes and just want to get to the end of the day and that's it so prove um, prove their theory yeah so um i feel it's it's been tough um it's very hard to swallow at first um because again uh knowing what i know and 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 knowing that they took my words and portrayed them differently than the story i was trying to say um i in feeling like they did that with some other friends and people i know as well i it's been hard because I, you know where do we go from here kind of question mm-hmm. um and to, to to kind of swallow that and realize that no one really cares about it right to say well we did everything we could to to get the right authorities to pay attention and they don't care um in my opinion just just probably didn't care about it maybe um it was tough it was real tough um for a while you know i to realize that the truth of what happened that might that night might never be fully understood uh tough right if you're your mm-hmm. best friend you, that's all you really want to know right even if the right people aren't brought to justice just to know everything right just to mm-hmm. to have that and be able to sleep easy at night um would be everything and, and know that what everything her mom has done hasn't been for naught right her kelly's yeah. put so much of her life on hold to help finally um figure out what had happened to her daughter it's sad that someone can devote that much time and money and attention to a cause and that basically um a, a, a good cause and that people don't care when it's something important like that it, it, it's one thing if it's um it's something that's not life and death but that's what happened here right and mm-hmm. and uh so it's it's really it's been hard to deal with and and at times like you know just kind of question the whole a bigger picture in all of, um you know law enforcement in general and um people's prerogatives but i try to try to go on and, and try not to let it weigh me down too much and i try to be positive and think that other people think like me and that mm-hmm. we're out here to do good and help each other out in this world but um yeah at times it's been really tough uh but it's it's good um i think that Tina had such a great group of friends um that a, a lot of us have just been there for each other um you know kelly and ozzy and david i you know i <laughs> i feel bad for some of my aunts and uncles because i i say that you know they're they're and, and they are very much closer than any aunt and uncle that I have. And, and in a lot of ways, Kelly and, and Ozzy and Dave are second parents to me. Um, mm-hmm. And, and you know, I lost my father recently and, and Kelly and, and, and Ozzy were there for me and uh, Dave as well. So, and, and Juddy and I see Rena from time to time. So it's, it's great that we have each other, right? That, that mm-hmm. Sheena's memory isn't lost and like what she did in the time that she was here um, and how she brought people together and how she um, influenced us um, is awesome. And I appreciate it every day. So it's, uh, it's tough to not have her, especially the first, you know, while wasn't as tough as I guess it has been more recently when I started thinking about her because I realized how much I've changed in the last eight years. Mm-hmm. And, um, I started to think like, well, where would, where would she be in, you know, what, where would she, what would she be doing now? Um, and, uh, you know, when I went and visited Kelly and Ozzy recently, um, you know, <laughs> I, I've become a vegetarian and, and they're on like a health kick with juicing. And I was like, Oh wow. Like yeah, yeah. she'd be doing, you know, that kind of thing. And, and you, you just don't know and yeah. it's, it sucks. So, but it's great that, that I have those people in my life because of Sheena and I'm thankful yeah. for it. The next person from Sheena's life I spoke with was her stepfather, Kevin Osborne. The first thing I asked him was when he first met Sheena and how often they spoke. Well, I met Sheena's mother. Um, she was a, a business partner that uh, worked for one of our clients and I really respected her and did not see her for several years later. And 
then a few years later, when I moved back to New York after I got divorced, uh, I met Kelly again and we did business together and I very much respected her. And after that, uh, we became friends and we started the date and that's when I met Sheena. Well, when Kelly and I were first dating, we didn't see each other all the time. Um, so I would see Sheena when she was at Kelly's house when I came over, um, or a lot of times she was over visiting her father as well. But we would speak then in the beginning. And then um, Kelly and I got serious over time. And after my divorce, I moved in with Kelly and Sheena. And so not only would I speak her on a daily basis, but um, I would help her wake up to her surge alarm. She had a, a very large speaking alarm that uh, would wake her up. And then I'd help her with uh, getting ready for school and also, uh, you know, dinners and those types of things. So once once I moved in with Kelly and she and I were very serious and knew we were going to get married, um, I was daily contact. We also talked about how Sheena treated him and how she took it when him and her mom got serious. You know, at first, anyone who moves in with their mother and is serious about marrying them um, is very concerned about that person. But we quickly had a relationship and I gained her trust and eventually she thought that I was the right person for her mother and it had been a long time her mother was very picky uh, about who she was going to spend the rest of her life with and Sheena respected that once I moved in we had a, a very good relationship and it, it got stronger as we went on. And it's not different than any other teenager. We had our difficulties, the discipline, the fights, um, those types of things. But she has a really big heart and she likes to make other people happy. And she saw that her mother was happy for the first time in 13 years. And so that was really important to her. So our relationship grew from there. Kevin thought of himself as a second father and loved Sheena as his own. I asked Kevin what he thought of Genoese. Any father, and I, I need to preface this, I am not her father. I am her stepfather. David, by far, is a great father with her. Um, but with Sheena moving down here, you know, I thought of her as a daughter. but by no means would replace her father. Um, I was skeptical, and as any father would be, about any daughter dating someone. And, you know, at first he was, he was great. You know, he was very congenial. He seemed normal in the beginning. Uh, I know he's trying to impress us. Um, and, you know, he would spend a lot of money, you know, making sure that he paid for all the dinners and those types of things. But, you know, Joe, in the back of my mind, I had to think, here we have a 40-year-old man dating a 20-year-old woman. Now, Sheena was extremely mature for her age extremely she was way ahead of herself very mature for a 20 year old she didn't want to hang out with a 20 year old playing xbox or beer pong and kill a keg those types of things she was way ahead of herself so i understand why sheena would have wanted to spend time with a more mature person but why in the world would a 40 year old want to spend time with a 20 year old other than a trophy type of thing. And so I was very skeptical at first, but you could tell as time went on that there were, were some issues going on. And again, when they were with us, they tried to uh, keep those in private. 
I also spoke with Kevin about what he noticed about Sheena during the holiday season and if he had heard anything about her staying in bed for consecutive days. Absolutely not. Quite the contrary. Um, I, right before the holidays, I had a dinner with a number of my clients, which are beer distributors. And Sheena got to know these people because we had gotten together all the time. And we, we had a holiday dinner and Sheena came in for that dinner and said, folks, I'm going over to this certain account that's right near here. And I'm celebrating the holidays and I would love you guys to come over. By no means did I see that whatsoever. He then told me the story about co-signing for Sheena's car and the agreement he made with Genoese. Well, Joe said that he could not co-sign for Sheena's loan on the car because he was still going through a divorce. And here's a guy dating somebody else and wanting to get married before he even finishes his divorce. Um, and I said, well, no problem, Joe. I'll, I'll do it for Sheena. You know, if you're, you don't want her to work, then if you're going to pay for it, I'll co-sign for it. I'll be responsible for it, but just make sure you pay for it. And then um, when Sheena passed, I talked to Joe about it. And he's like, not my problem. I didn't co-sign for it. I'm like, okay. So I ended up uh, paying for the lease of a third car that I didn't need, but it's just very exemplatory of what Joe did after Sheena died. He gave up on all his financial responsibilities. He started going out with other women. It just shows what type of person, I won't say human being, he was because he's not. Kevin went on to talk about how Genoese reacted after Sheena passed away. As soon as, as, soon as Sheena passed away, he was done with everything. He couldn't wait after the services in New York to get out of New York. And the next week, he, he was in New Orleans with other women. He was, his hands were washed, not only of his financial obligations, but of any type of anything towards a human being, compassion. I mean, his fiance, quote unquote, was just murdered. And he doesn't even care. He just walked away from everything. It was like a week later, strip club, New Orleans. I'm not paying for this. I'm done. I'm looking for the next best thing. Kevin was never interviewed by the FDLE or Bradenton Beach Police, but he wanted to give this statement. Kelly is the most amazing woman I have ever met in my life. She is determined on this. She went in 100% investigating her own daughter's murder. And the things that she had to do from autopsy pictures to investigating crime scenes to investigating Bradenton Beach Police, um, not many people could have done that. And I know that Sheena is down looking upon her and is very proud of what she has done. But I also know that Sheena wants Kelly to have a life and that now that we have the Archangels of Justice helping us out, they can carry the baton for us and Kelly can live that life that she needs to and that Sheena would want her to do. And uh, she's finally getting a chance to do that and and get back to work, and she's really doing a great job of it. The last person in Sheena's life who wanted to speak on this podcast was Dave Morris's wife, Lisa Lane. She had known Sheena since she was a little girl and had some great stories about her. One of them was from when Sheena was 11 years old. She had asked me one time years ago, like when she was probably 10 or 11, and wanted to know what I wanted for my birthday. I go, you know what I want, honey? Just make me dinner. That's all I want. So I came home that from work that night, and she had dinner on the table, candlelight. It was that meant more to me than any gift anybody could ever get me. Lisa then talked about the relationship between herself and Sheena as she grew up. We got along beautifully when she was younger, and you know when she was a teenager. 
like most teenagers, they rebel, and she rebelled against me. And then as she got older, things just got better and better. Although the relationship was contentious during Sheena's teenage years, her love for Lisa was never more apparent than when Lisa lost her mother. Oh, there were so many of them. I mean, she, as much as she disliked me at certain times, when my mom passed away, she was right there for me. She just didn't say anything. She just said, I know there's nothing that I could say that could make the pain go away. So all she did was just hug me. Just a lot of little things that wouldn't mean much at the, you know, but now it just, at the time when she was doing these small little things for me, just like meant the world for me. Lisa was very affected by Sheena's death and never believed it was suicide. She had hoped many times that the Bradenton Beach Police would reopen the investigation, and she talked about these times. There were a lot of times that we were all very hopeful when the medical examiner changed it from suicide to undetermined. That, in my eyes, was, okay, now the Bradenton Beach Police have to do something. It's not a suicide. It's undetermined. You have to investigate this. When they didn't, another letdown. And then when the FDLE took over, that was again, well, actually before that, the polygraph, when he failed the polygraph on Dr. Phil. That to us was like, okay, good. Now somebody's going to listen to us. Somebody's going to do something. And again, nothing. And then the FDLE. Again, we're thinking, this is perfect, and now we're finally getting somewhere. Somebody's actually going to do something, and once again, we get nothing, absolutely nothing. And their so-called investigation was disgusting. They spent more time disproving all the evidence that we had given them than what the Diaz did. Lisa had a final statement about the case. Somebody to do something. I had listened to the last podcast where Sal kept saying a civil suit. And Joe, if I had the money personally, I would do it. I would sue them. I would sue all of them. And it even for a dollar. I, it's not the money. I want them to be held accountable for not doing their job, which is sad. They have to be held accountable one way or the other. They have to be held accountable. No family should go through what we have been going through. No family deserves this. Before I get some final thoughts from Kelly, Sal, and Ira, Sheena's father, Dave Morris, who Sheena often referred to as Daddy-O or To-Do, wanted me to read a statement. It is a little on the longer side, but very powerful nonetheless, and I did not feel it was right to take anything out. It goes... I am not a father in denial. I know my daughter did not take her own life, and for those of you who have followed the podcast from the beginning, have probably come to realize Sheena did not take her own life, and any proof of that does not exist by law enforcement. I would like to take this time to clear up one of the most common questions Kelly and I have been asked over the years. Why would law enforcement let this person get away with killing Sheena and cover it up? It starts with the Bradenton Beach Police and the initial call for domestic violence. Plain and simple, Joe Genoese should have been arrested that night for domestic violence had the Bradenton Beach Police followed state law. So from that time on, the Bradenton Beach Police has always been afraid of a wrongful death lawsuit against them by my family. One of the many public record requests obtained by Sheena's family in keeping track of the Bradenton Beach Police and their officers after Sheena's death was a death investigation just weeks after Sheena's death. The same officer that responded to Sheena's hotel room that night Officer Basil is dispatched to a death investigation. Once again, he does not follow procedure and is written up by his sergeant in a letter of reprimand. In that letter, it is stated, quote, that my concern with this is that we just talked about this liability in our last meeting and not following procedure will cost this department a huge lawsuit in the future, end quote. Yes, this was done one month after Sheena's death. That tells me that their last meeting was how they mishandled Sheena's investigation. Officer Basil is also cited for, quote, lying in his police report, just like he did in Sheena's police report. The FDLE is also trying to cover a mistake they made in Sheena's case. 
A couple of years prior to reopening Sheena's case, Sheena's family had sent written complaints to the FDLE about the way Sheena's death was handled by the Bradenton Beach Police Department. The Bradenton Beach Police does not have an internal affairs department, so we had no choice. The FDLE are supposed to police the police. So the FDLE sends two agents to the Bradenton Beach Police Department to conduct what they call the courtesy review of Sheena's so-called death investigation. At the time, the FDLE concludes no wrongdoing on how the Bradenton Beach Police handled Sheena's investigation. Yet two years later, after much public outcry and pressure from numerous media outlets, the FDLE forms a group of experts called the, quote, smart panel, to once again go to the Bradenton Beach Police Department and look into Sheena's death. This smart panel finds at least 15 so-called concerns, which are actually mistakes made by the Bradenton Beach Police Department that they felt needed to be corrected and or reinvestigated. So the first two FDLE agents who conducted a courtesy review now look like idiots, and they were wrong. There are a lot of problems with Sheena's investigation by the Bradenton Beach Police Department. So one of the first two agents conducted a courtesy review is Agent Carl Shedlock, who I will say has the ego the size of the Gulf of Mexico, very cocky and arrogant, and is now somewhat of a lead detective in the reopening of Sheena's investigation. So just like the Bradenton Beach Police did, Agent Shedlock cannot admit the FDLE was wrong or made a mistake, must now cover this up and downplay Sheena's death as a suicide. I would also like to say that this entire inquiry of Sheena's death by the FDLE was given to us on a CD, by a request of course. This disc is labeled, quote, Operation Beach Assist, which tells me that the FDLE was just assisting the Bradenton Beach Police in calling this a suicide, and it was never considered a death investigation. The FDLE never did prove the whereabouts of Joe Genoese at the time of Sheena's death. The cell phone pings made by Genoese were recorded on a map to show his whereabouts that night. Well, it was proven by two different communications experts that these maps were reported wrong by the FDLE. And the FDLE admitted they were incorrect when we confronted them about it, and stated it still wouldn't have changed the outcome of the investigation. Alibi statements presented to us were fabricated, as proven by the Archangels of Justice, who did an actual recorded interview of one of the people who was at Genoese's house that night. It pretty much says Genoese walked into one room to show his face and say, quote, I'm here. And minutes later, he walks out another door and leaves his home again. Genoese has always maintained the same story that he went home, people saw him, and then he went to sleep. The truth is, two different people in that house that night went into Genoese's room and he was not there. He told one person who saw him leave the house that he was going to the casino. Genoese and his car were not seen at that house again until 9 a.m. the next morning. If the FDLE can't prove where Genoese was at the time of Sheena's death, how can they say he wasn't responsible? A tip emailed to the Bradenton Beach Police from a person stating Genoese called a friend at roughly 3 a.m. the morning of Sheena's death and states Genoese is looking for some kind of help. This tip is turned over to the FDLE to look into because the Bradenton Beach Police have no clue about police work. The FDLE never contacts the person who submitted the tip or the person Genoese actually called that night. Instead, the FDLE simply claims that Genoese's cell phone records do not indicate he made a call at that time. Maybe he used a different cell phone other than his own to cover his tracks. So instead, the FDLE dismisses the tip completely because they had interviewed Genoese's ex-wife, who claims said person did not even live in Florida at the time. Who cares where the guy lives? Maybe Genoese was looking for advice on how to cover up or stage a murder, and it was not actually physical help. Sheena's family did contact the person who submitted the tip, and the person who Genoese did call definitely lived in Florida at the time. Genoese also lied to the FDLE about having his own key to the hotel room, which means he could have re-entered that room unannounced. FDLE has that subpoena record from the hotel showing Genoese did sign for two keys, yet they never did hold him accountable for his lie. Bradenton Beach Police state in a subpoena to a circuit court judge while trying to obtain a cell phone record for Genoese that a woman in a hotel room next to Sheena says that an alarm clock went off at 5 a.m. and was immediately shut off. It wasn't Sheena that turned off that alarm clock, as she was already deceased at that time, according to the medical examiner's report. The FDLE went to Sheena's hotel room and proved that that alarm clock would automatically shut off in 30 minutes, if not shut off manually. We all know who was in that room at 5 a.m. and turned off the alarm clock, and he was staging Sheena's death and the room to look like a suicide. You know, and I know it. Shame on all the law enforcement involved in this cover-up over fear of a lawsuit or tarnished egos. What you did was criminal. More time should have been spent investigating Sheena's death 
than what she was doing at 12 years old. I would like to conclude by saying, quote, Sheena, till we meet again on the other side, I miss and love you more every day, Bumblebee, and will continue to be the greatest fan of your life, end quote. Signed, daddy Kelly shared her thoughts about the podcast. I feel the podcast was the perfect venue to get Sheena's story and the truth as to what was done out there. There's no other one-hour television show that could do this as it would have taken an entire season. It's our hope that these podcasts will fall into the right ears one day, but also to help listeners understand that these cases are not isolated and it's become an epidemic. So many people, so many strangers have sent me heartfelt messages and asked if there's anything they could do to help. There is. So please help us by listening and sharing the entire episodes so that the injustice in our system will stop. Thank you to all the listeners of this podcast. Sheena, we love you and miss you. I think now I can say I have done all that I could do. I'd also like to thank Joe Ross, our host of this podcast, and the Archangels of Justice from the bottom of our hearts. Sal and Ira wanted to make statements about the podcast and Florida law enforcement. It was shoddy. They wanted to believe it was a suicide from the first few minutes that they walked into that hotel room to cover themselves for their dereliction of duty on the domestic dispute from the night before. And everything since then has been nothing but a cover-up to try to protect Bradenton Beach from a lawsuit in Manatee County Sheriff's Office. Pretty obvious, very unprofessionally done. Their investigation was, was shoddy. Is the only word I can even think of other than want to say it was corrupt, but we'll, we'll stick with shoddy for now. You know, and as far as what I'd like to see happen with these podcasts is that other families that have had the same thing happen to them, where they've been victimized by the police who won't listen to them and ignoring the evidence of a homicide and classifying their children's deaths as suicides or accidents, that all those families will join us to be that one vocal point that they can all come to and get this nationwide because that's what it takes. Ira and I have traveled nationwide on various cases. So it's, it's not a localized event. It's not just Florida. It's all over the country. And we have the cases to prove it. We've been there. We, we've worked at families. And we really want these families to join together with us so we have a louder voice that maybe we can make some positive changes made. Because that's ultimately what we're after here is to make positive changes within law enforcement and the community so there's, there's no more of the strife no more anger. You know, we want to get trust back in law enforcement. Ira and I were both police officers and we've never left the profession in the sense that even though we've retired and, and actually put the badge away, doesn't mean that we don't care about the profession. We do. And we always will. And we don't want to see officers hurt and we don't want to see the public hurt. And, and that's what this is all about. So when people think that the archangels of justice are out to bash the police, that's, that's not true. That's the furthest thing from our mission. We want to make things better for everybody. The Braden and Beach Police Department and its officers and the Manatee County Sheriff's Office and their crime scene technician and the state polygrapher are all overseen by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, which actually sets the performance standards for all law enforcement in Florida. It is obvious that the FDLE is leading the cover-up in the Sheena Morris case where they are not capable of tracking an elephant through a snowdrift. Couple that with Assistant State Attorney Art Brown's phony report written in behalf of the Sheena Morris cover-up and with the full support of State Attorney Ed Brodsky shows this is nothing but government equine excrement. I have been thinking about ways to close this case and could not come up with anything until Kelly read her statement to me. I thought it was the best ending we could do for this heart-wrenching case. The statement I would like to make about Sheena's case is that the only thing 
that law enforcement and the state attorney's office proved is that they are capable and very good at falsifying documents and others' interviews to suit their needs. And they can do it because they were given a badge to do it. People will ask why. Why would they do this? Let me summarize this for the listeners of this podcast. The police botched the domestic violence case severely. Then Sheena's found dead. By keeping this a suicide, they avoided a lawsuit for not protecting Sheena. For four years, they refused to look at the ineptness of the Bradenton Beach Police Department. And when they did, it was only to assist them in covering up the mess that they made. The state attorney's office stepped in to help the FDLE cover this up. Two things here. Art Brown won't try a case unless he can win. And that he could not do because the case was so badly botched. Secondly, also keep in mind that the state attorney's office needs to stay on good terms with law enforcement so they can use, use them in other cases. Yes, it's that simple. The good old boys club. From the very start of the reopening of this case, four years later, because they couldn't shut us up, they knew exactly what they were going to do. They slapped us hard for fighting for the truth. I would also like the listeners of this podcast to know that Sheena was a very loving young woman who loved life, her babies, and her family. She was happy and excited about life. As much as the FDLE and Art Brown worked hard, to sabotage Sheena and our family, I will let you know that all they did was prove that they don't work to serve and protect the public. They serve and protect themselves. That was proven for sure and without a doubt. I will share one last thing that our listeners don't know. The final day we met with Art Brown, state attorney, and FDLE, they concluded their case as suicide. They took one last swing at us. I had asked if they would wait one day before releasing to the media their report so we could have a moment to digest what they had said. They responded by saying, we aren't releasing any report. However, we hadn't even gotten out of the building and into our car. They hit that button on the computer, and every media reporter began calling my phone for a statement. I know they sat in that room. They high-fived each other, and they said, screw that bitch. We fixed her. The last thing I wanted to cover about this case before we end this episode is where the key players are at today. According to our research, Joe Genoese is now 52 years old and has moved from Indian Rocks Beach, Florida to Kissimmee, Florida, where he owns a contracting business called Complete Wall and Coating Systems. Officer Mike Basil and Detective Diaz are both still employed with the Bradenton Beach Police Department. The FDLE, on the other hand, has continued to go about their work of covering up their officers' mistakes versus reprimanding them, and we found similar cover-ups in multiple other cases investigated by the FDLE. Until we band together and tell organizations like the FDLE that this is enough, this is going to continue to keep happening, and murderers will be allowed to walk the streets. This is not the end of the Sheena Morris case, but the next chapter in the family's fight for justice. Now it is you, the public's job, to give this family the resolution they deserve. You have heard this story and all the problems with the investigation. Now share it with your friends, either through word of mouth or on your favorite social media sites. Florida law enforcement, check that, all law enforcement, needs to understand that these types of cases cause public mistrust and seriously affects the credibility of law enforcement agencies across the country. If a Florida state overseer of law enforcement can turn a blind eye to this kind of blatant misconduct and ignorance of basic police procedures, it calls into question whether they should even exist in the first place. The final thing I'd like to say about this case, because I had a chance to speak with Jan Johnson and Michael Berkland this week, and they were the first ones to really point out all the mistakes by the Bradenton Beach Police, and along with Lee Williams, got this case the national attention it deserves. Without them, the Archangels of Justice would have never heard about this case, and you would never be listening to this podcast. So from both Sheena's family and the Archangels of Justice, I would like to say thank you to Jan Johnson, Michael Berkland, and Lee Williams. To our listeners, we are very excited for the response we have received and our download numbers continue to grow. We could not do this without you. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We hope you enjoyed the first season of the Archangels of Justice Case Files.
A special thanks to Mike Mack, who did all the music for this podcast. If you'd like to hear more samples of Mike Mack's work, you can go to his website, www.mike-mack.com, or you can follow him on Twitter, at Mike Mack. Again, thank you for listening. We've already begun work on our next case, which will be about Angel Seiler from Susanville, California. We hope to release the first episode of that case within the next few months, but follow us on Facebook or Twitter for the exact dates. We will also be expanding our YouTube channel with video that will be going through the evidence from the Sheena Morris case. We hope that this podcast will launch something greater and be the voice for victims forgotten by our justice system. The Archangels of Justice don't care about who is right. They care about getting it right. And we will be back soon with the Angel Siler case. Mm-hmm.